true that God told Joseph that all the creeds were an abomination and all the churches were corrupt. What is so abominable about the Apostles' Creed? Well, look at the Apostles' Creed. You can go and you can show that creed to a Mormon. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and crucified, dead, and buried, and descended into hell. The grave, according to Acts 2.27, descended into hell. And the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic, which means unified, church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If all the creeds of Joseph Smith's day, and Apostles' Creed was one of them, were corrupt and abominable. What's so abominable about this creed? I think your Mormon friends will be hard-pressed to find anything abominable about that creed. Because Mormonism does subscribe to all of the tenets of that creed. So then you have to ask your Mormon friend, if not all of the creeds of Christendom were abominable when Joseph Smith received his first vision, how could God have authored the first vision? If not all the creeds were abominable, that would have been a lie. God is not a liar. God is not the author of falsehood. So if all the creeds were not abominable, if at least one creed was not abominable at the time when this first vision account happened, then who else could be the source of that first vision? Since Joseph Smith admitted that some revelations are of the devil, how do we know he wasn't deceived by Satan when he received his first vision? Again, Joseph Smith couldn't tell where his visions were coming from. And some revelations are of the devil. Well, God's obviously not the author of it because God is the author of truth. He wouldn't tell a lie to Joseph Smith. So the only, only other source we could say is that it was either from Joseph Smith's heart, and his own imagination, or it was from the devil. Another thing you can show the Mormon is in Joseph Smith's translation of Exodus 33, verse 20. He states, And no sinful man hath at any time, neither shall there be any sinful men at any time, that shall see my face and live. So not only does he take Exodus thirty-three twenty 20, that in the Bible says no man can see, God says no man can see my face and live, but Joseph Smith expounds on it. He says no man at any time in his sinful state will be able to see God's face and live. And even Joseph Smith admitted that he was a sinner, that he didn't always do the things that he should. And so if Joseph Smith saw Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ, he contradicted even his own translation of Exodus 33, which you have to go back. Mormons embrace the Bible insofar as it's translated correctly. Well, Joseph Smith corrected this translation. So if you're going to follow Joseph Smith's translation, he even contradicted the translation he said that was correct of Exodus 33, verse 20. So then you have to ask your Mormon friend, since no man would ever at any time see God, the Father's face, how can Joseph Smith have seen the Father in the current edition of his first vision account? So we see there are some real problems with the first vision account. Not only as we look at the historical renditions of it that Joseph Smith gave, but also as we compare this with the actual content of the revelation. It does not fit with truth, the fact that not all the creeds were abominable at the time when Joseph Smith received the revelation. Does the Bible foretell of an apostasy? It talks about a partial but not a complete apostasy. In 1 Timothy 4.1 it says, In the latter times some shall depart from the faith. So the simple fact that only some would depart from the faith does not warrant a complete apostasy, which according to documentary history of the church would be the only thing that would warrant the establishment of the LDS church. So if the church didn't completely apostatize, there wouldn't be a need for a restored church. The gospel was given and promised to last 
and endure throughout all generations. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21, unto him be glory in the church throughout all generations by Christ Jesus. Glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Ephesians 3, 21. How can apostate church give glory to God throughout all generations? That would be hard. Jude chapter 3. The faith was once delivered unto the saints. That word for once, haparx, means once and for all, that it was final. The faith was delivered once. Faith was delivered one time, and there would not be a need for it to be re-delivered through a man by the name of Joseph Smith. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So if the church became apostate at the death of the apostles, then what does that say about Jesus' ability to maintain and hold his church against the gates of hell? Wouldn't we have to say that the gates of hell overran the church if it became so apostate that no authority was left in it? Mormons often like to point to Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Well, what about Acts chapter 3, verse 21? where it talks about a restitution of all things. Does that speak of a restoration of the gospel? No, in reality, when you look at Acts chapter 3, verse 21, we see that Jesus Christ, it says, whom, Jesus Christ, the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. If you read Acts chapter 3, it's talking about the restoration of of the creation of God that was cursed at the time when Adam and Eve sinned. That ultimately in Christ, Jesus paid for the penalty of our sins. And, and when the new millennial reign of Christ comes, then the earth, the new heavens and the new earth will come. And it will be restored to the way God originally intended in the Garden of Eden. And we see those illusions discussed in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 through 24 about how the restoration of all things or the restitution of all things is speaking of how we are under a curse. Creation and all mankind is under the curse until the revealing of the sons of God, until the fullness has come where Christ returns and reigns on this earth. So that's how you can answer that verse in Acts chapter 3, verse 21. So you can ask your Mormon friend about this restoration, this idea that the church was apostate. You can bring up these scriptures in the Bible that we just discussed about how the gospel would endure to all generations and would not need to be restored. And then you can bring up a couple scriptures in their books that can be difficult for them to, to answer. According to LDS scripture, the Apostle John never died in Doctrine and Covenants section 7. And the three Nephites, who were given priesthood authority in 3 Nephi 28, they never died. Now, according to Mormonism, Christianity began to apostatize at the death of the apostles. But if you have John, the apostle John never dying, according to Mormon scripture, and the three Nephites never dying, then how could it have gotten apostate if these guys are still holding the priesthood authority by their own scriptures? That can be a tough question. If the LDS church is the one true church, another question you can ask them is why aren't John and the three Nephites serving in the LDS church today? I mean, if you're the one true church, where are they? Could it be that maybe, you know, if you look at Mormonism, it's splintered off after the death of Joseph Smith. You have about approximately 200 splinter groups that have broken off from Mormonism. Now they think we are all confused because we have so many denominations of Christianity, but we each call each other brothers and we don't call each other, you know, apostates. But in the Mormon church, they have 200 splinter groups out there. So, you know, you can ask your Mormon friend about these Apostle John and the three Nephites that never died. And could it be that maybe they ended up in one of those 200 splinter groups? Ooh, interesting. You know, they held the true priesthood authority, 